initiative. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to all to tonight's talk, which is going to help us kick off the News Literacy Initiative this week. It's Media Literacy Week around the world today, and we're helping to celebrate. Never has there been more reason for an active citizenry to think critically about the information we consume. Never has there been more reason to fear the opposite. At Penn State, our News Literacy Initiative will involve K-12 teacher training, a podcast, a radio show that will be heard around the state, resources for responding to specific challenges that arise, and a News Literacy Ambassador program tied to student engagement networks here that will help us take our mission to foster better informed citizenry throughout the Penn State University system and the communities we serve. In fact, our inaugural set of ambassadors is helping sign up students to our news readership program right now outside of the table. And if you have not signed up for your free access to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or Penn Live, you, you should. It's paid for. So please see them afterward. Last week, the New York Times published a story asserting that disinformation has become the defining feature of American politics. Educating people about how our media system works <coughs> at unprecedented scale and about the kind of news we need as a democracy is vital and part of this effort. So that's why we're so thrilled to be joined tonight by the Pointer Institute, which for nearly five decades has been promoting the idea that journalism done right is a social good that is fundamental to a functioning democracy. Pointer, Pointer champions freedom of expression, civil dialogue, and compelling journalism that helps citizens participate in healthy democracies. It educates journalists and public and through a variety of issues, initiatives including MediaWise, PolitiFact, and the International Fact Checking Network. It helps us cut through the noise that gets in the way of democratic deliberation and often pits us against one another. So tonight we're joined by two of their finest. First, Barbara Allen, who is director of the college program at Group Pointer and is managing editor of Pointer.org. And if you follow Pointer on Twitter or check in the Pointer.org regularly like I do, you might have read her latest piece on the critical role that media literacy must play in our society today. And then Al Tompkins, who spent three decades as a journalist and received some of journalism's highest awards, including the National Emmy, the Japan Prize, the American Bar Association, Silver Gavel, the Peabody, the Seven National Headliner Awards, the Robert F. Kennedy Award, and the Iris Award. In the years since, he has been a tireless promoter of ethical public interest journalism, helping to author the National Codes of Ethics for both the National Press Photographers Association and the Radio and Television and Digital News Association. Now, we'll be talking tonight uh, with us about what's at stake as we continue to think and discuss the challenges we face in our news media ecosystem. That is the title. Yeah. That's all we keep it short, keep the expectations low, and then we all do it. So welcome everybody, glad to be out here tonight. And uh, I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to jump right outside. We really appreciate being outside. Is it okay if I can you guys? So one of the things that I want to get out is the difference in what I think of as information and misinformation. I'm going to show you examples of all these things. And I'm also going to show you how fake is fake, how liars lie, and why they do that. Um, because there are a lot of reasons that they do it, but it's important that we think about what motivations my buyers have a lot in, in the city. So I think there's a difference between information just facts and misinformation, which are just facts that we got wrong. And sometimes we get facts wrong. We say 12, we mean 14. And we say 32, we mean 71. And sometimes facts just, we just get them wrong. But we don't have any ill intent. That's very different from the next category, which is disinformation. So I think disinformation is I meant for you to get this wrong. I meant to mislead you. I intentionally misled you. I think this is the most toxic of them all. And then fourth, the very much aligned propaganda. So propaganda, in my mind, isn't necessarily evil intent. It's just sort of one side of the story. Commercials are largely propaganda. All of the uh, campaign commercials that you see are propaganda. But they're not mean spirits, they're not necessarily even wrong. They're just one side. You know, you know, this commercial says, oh, and by the way, he's not very experienced, and sometimes he gets stuff wrong, and sometimes he gets nothing. 
they wouldn't be that truthful. So propaganda, to me, is one-sided storytelling, but not necessarily evil. Does that make sense to you? All right, so with that in mind, why would people intentionally mislead us? And you may have your own motivations. If you do, I want to ask you to shout them out. But the way I sort of think of that is, first of all, four big fighters. One of them, political influence. But as we saw with, uh, with the last campaign, uh, with interference from other governments, sometimes misinformation doesn't have to do with whatever it is they're saying, but instead they're banking followers for other possible events. So they might put up something that's fairly innocuous. They get a lot of followers because it's interesting. But those people are following that, that, that social media site, for example, and later they'll pepper it with something that really does that. Um, so uh, the uh, Comey investigation, for example, uh, identified a lot of Facebook pages that were put up by the Russian government, so the, the, uh, the investigation said. And much of that ended up being used later for things that didn't have to do with the initial post. So it's building an audience for a later. The second then is financial. That's obvious. Um, it's just page views, it's likes, it's followers, it's all of the, the normal motivations. And a lot of this information does have at its root a financial motive. It's just that pure. But sometimes misinformation or disinformation has at its core distraction. I'm trying to get your attention for something so that you're not paying attention to this other thing that's going on. It's just merely a distraction. Don't look at that, look at this. And then finally, and this is the one that's hardest to pin down, is the category that is just causing chaos. I'm sorry. Uh, just causing chaos. Sometimes <coughs> this information ends up just being, you know what, I just like to stir things up. And it's difficult sometimes to understand why people do what they do when it seems so harmful to people. But sometimes they're just stirring stuff up to make people uh, uh, walk and make noise. And it's very difficult to understand that sometimes. That's usually when my wife says, don't they have something better to do? My wife's the one I'm losing person. So it's hard to understand sometimes why people do that. So let's look at misinformation just as an example. I want to talk just for a second about political polling. So these are some of the big races that are going on around the country. These are numbers as of this morning uh, from Real Clear Politics. By the way, anyway, uh, I'll try always to cite my sources. Let's see if it is. Is this better? <laughs> I sound like Barry White now. Don't I? <laughs> Those of you of a certain age, Barry White was a singer in the nineteen seventy. Uh, okay, this is, should I start over again? No, yeah, no you're okay. I, as I was saying, um, that's funny. I was even I was listening to myself. Um, so let's look at these polling numbers, okay? And I was actually talking to a, a reporter about this and sort of scolding him about it a little bit last night. Um, look, here's the thing about polling numbers: is that journalists make too much of a big deal about polling numbers because we expect for these to be accurate to within a number. And they simply aren't. They're a barometer, not a thermometer. They, they give us an approximation. They're much better when we look at them in a trend, right? But we put too, way too much emphasis on this. So let me give you an example. Um, I hear you've got a pretty good Senate race going on here, a little bit of interest. Um, so let's say, most political polls have a margin of error that's plus or minus about 3%, although I've seen some polls fairly recently that are 4%. I actually saw one on real politics of 6%. So it's like, I can guess within 6%. I don't know anything about the rate. So here's the thing. If you have a 3% margin of error, and let's say that candidate X has 43%, candidate Y has 47%. What truthful thing could we say about this poll as it sits? It's a toss up, but I can clearly see that somebody's ahead by six points. How could it be a toss up? That man gets a prize. I don't know what it is, but he gets one. So yeah, you're exactly right. So. If it's plus or minus 3%, then that could be as low as 50 and as high as 56. And that could be 
from 50 to 44, the gentleman is exactly right. It is a virtual tie. And by the way, there's nothing new about that in this race. Every one of those races I showed you is a virtual tie. It has been virtually all year. The only headline in any of them is nothing's changed. It's a really tight race because you know what? America is relatively evenly divided politically right now. And so all these reports of people saying, well, the race is getting tighter because so-and-so went up one world and that one. All it meant is you got a new sample that's still within the same margin of error. There's no news here. How do I know that? Well, I can look at all of this polling data. And I can see the margin of error here. As you can see, most of them are right now because polling is so wonky right now because people don't people hate answering polls. The margin of error in a lot of these polls is 4%, which means you'd have to be over 8% difference in order to have any kind of conclusive poll. And none of them, well, I don't know, none of them, almost none of them. Here's one, here's another, but most of them are within the margins of error. So what do I want you to take out of this? I want you to be critical thinkers when you look at this stuff. Instead of saying, oh, well, so-and-so is winning by 2%, he must be winning. No, I want you to say, it's a tie. And it's been a tie, by the way, here in Pennsylvania, it's been a tie since this summer, really. So really, since the middle of August, you've been within the margin of error. I'm, and this is an amalgam of all the real clear politics polls. This isn't one poll, it's like 30 polls. I just made up a number, by the way, but it's something like that. Does that make sense to you? So I would call this misinformation. I don't think the journalists are trying to mislead you by telling you that the polls are more accurate than they are. I just don't think they understand it. In fact, I know they don't. All right, so what about disinformation? This is a little clip from a news um, broadcast in Washington, D.C. recently. There are three main reasons people here in Montgomery County say they have an issue with cell phone towers. One, just take a look for yourself at how close they can be to homes. Second, neighbors are worried about property values going down. And lastly, the negative environmental and health effects. Wi-Fi radiation blows the blood. It can cause a sting and throb of pain in your hand when you're holding your cell phone. I have grown. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> that opening sound button is good. Did you hear the sound button? You want me to play it again? Yeah. You do, don't you? All right. There are three main reasons people here in Montgomery County say they have an issue with cell phone towers. One, well, just take a look for yourself at how close they can be to homes. Second, neighbors are worried about property values going down. And lastly, the negative environmental and health effects. Wi-Fi radiation blows the blood. It can cause a sting and throb of pain in your hand. Do any of you have a throbbing radiation in your hand from holding your cell phone? If so, I would get rid of that phone. Okay, so drop your Android and get an Apple phone. It won't drop. <laughs> I mean, it's just absurd that they would use a soundbite from somebody saying Wi-Fi radiation causes a pain in your hand when you get home. Um, and yet, I'm not saying that I think the TV station believes that. But what they've done is they've given voice to blatantly false information. You tend to believe what you heard first. If, if you hear disinformation first, it takes a lot of work to reel you back in so you don't believe that anymore, right? You tend to believe what you hear first. And so I don't know how many people believe that, but it's not true. And I understand why you might give that voice because you're trying to be fair, but being fair doesn't mean you give voice to blatantly false information. If I'm doing a story about the Earth being round, I don't owe flat Earthers any airtime because you know what? The Earth's not flat. It's just not. So this whole idea of sort of false equivalency is another thing that's going on with journalists is they're trying to be fair, but in so doing, they're giving voice to blatantly false information. I don't think that's journalism. 
But I also don't think you as consumers ought to be asking or expecting that. Don't give voice to blatantly false information. They don't validate it by giving it voice. There are three. Wi-Fi radiation blows the blood. No, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't. So how do you go about how do you go about ascertaining true information? Um, do you want to know how bad inflation is? Yesterday, yes, I had a nice lunch at Taco Bell. It cost me about $28 at Taco Bell's lunch. You said, wait, wait, what? <laughs> wait, what? Do you want to know how bad inflation is? Yesterday, yes, I had a nice lunch at Taco Bell. It cost me about $28 at Taco Bell's lunch. Now, that would be bad inflation if you pay $28 for lunch at Taco Bell. Now, remember, this guy is a financial advisor. I'm just warning you, if you want to take advice from him, that's on you. But he just said inflation is so bad, and the Democrats are so awful, that he had to pay $28 for lunch at Taco Bell. And one of the anchors said, wait, was that just you? And he said, yeah, it was just me. It's $28. Is that possible, friends? You students, yes? Yeah. Get back there going, yeah? That's possible for you to have lunch and pay $28? Your parents are going to be really happy to get you off the payroll, brother. I'll tell you that. Uh, what would you have to eat to have $28 for you? Huh? Five or six tacos. Five or six tacos? Look, we actually did. Sorry. We actually did the menu. We actually did the menu to see if we could come up with it, including New York City tax. That's what you would have to order to come up with $28. I don't know about you, but no normal person would eat that for lunch, would they? Is that a bit of an exaggeration? Plus, as my Taco Bell friend back there would tell you, you could get a better deal if you bought a meal deal, right? I'm going to say, I mean, you know, you don't have to do that. <laughs> If you want to make the point that inflation is bad and I pay a lot more for food, fine. But claiming that Taco Bell lunches cost $28 is just blatantly misinformation, if not disinformation. This is, uh, he used to be the president of the United States, and this is one of his more interesting things. If you have a windmill anywhere near your house, congratulations. Your house just went down 75% in value. And they say the noise causes cancer. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Windmills cause cancer because of the noise. There's just no truth to it. It's not true. Windmill noise is not proven ever to cause cancer. Windmills cause all sorts of other problems if you're a burger. But windmill noise does not cause cancer. It just doesn't. If you have a wind... Just the mind, you know, this, this was last week. This was last week. Just a mind, you know, I mean, just sincerely. I say this as the father of a man who won the bronze star of the Speaker's Service Medal and lost his life in Iraq. Imagine the courage, the daring, the genuine sight. Just a wait, wait, what? What did you just hear him say? It went right by you. Watch. Just a mind, you know, I mean, just sincerely. I say this as the father of a man who won the bronze star of the Speaker's Service Medal and lost his life in Iraq. Imagine your courage. What's wrong with that? Did Bo Biden die in Iraq? What did Bo Biden die from? Just window. <laughs> now, I can't explain how he got it wrong about his son dying in Iraq. I can't explain that. I don't understand that. I don't know what was in his mind. But what I know is it's bizarre. And, and I would also say to you, quite honestly, I don't think this got nearly as much publicity as if Trump had said it. I just don't think it did, and I don't know why. But I do think that it was bizarre, and while I'm not much for publicizing slips of tongues, just because we're all normal and human and I'll probably do something tonight, but not ill-conceived, Ill, Ill what I would say to you is something as big as that that's pretty big. If you can't correctly say how your son died, that's pretty big. Now, the tongue. 
So uh, Tucker uh, is one, I don't spend a lot of energy talking about um, Tucker's uh, problems, but this is one that he said uh, last week that I thought was interesting. So here's an amazing story that's been affecting here. This week, CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is expected to add the COVID-19 vaccine to the list of required childhood vaccines. If this happens, your children will not be able to attend school without taking the COVID shot. That's not true. It's just not true. Why isn't it true? What's wrong with that? Do you want to hear it again? What did he say? Somebody summarize. What did he just say on national television? What did he just say? The most watched cable show. What did he just say? And it turns out it was announced. It turns out the CDC did add the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, to its recommended childhood vaccines. That's true. What's not true? Not required. Say again. What do you mean it's not mandatory? The CDC. Who, who makes who makes the rules about the mandatory vaccines? The states. The CDC can't tell the states what what to require, and so it may be true that states might make it mandatory, but states make their own decisions about a lot of these vaccines. They don't agree. Some have um, some have mandatory vaccines that are on their, uh, on their list that others don't agree on their lists. So it's just not true. And it was never true. So here's an amazing story. Isn't it? But one of the things that disinformation purveyors do is they'll convince you that I am going to tell you something that nobody else is willing to tell you because I'm so brave. Did you notice that? Here's an amazing story that others won't tell you. Oh, it must be juicy. Right? So whenever somebody has a little piece of rumor, very often they'll come to you and say, Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Please don't tell anybody else because, you know, this is really a big thing that you know, like, oh, okay, tell me, tell me, right? It must be good. So here's an amazing story that's been affecting the very This week, you see? Okay, so that's not true. Um, now, the date today is 10 24, yes? Is that right? So here's what I want you to know that sometime between now and midnight, I guess, all of your debts are going to be erased. Can we clap for that? Yeah, yeah it's true. Because I heard it on QA. Oh. <laughs> All debts, who has credit cards, mortgages, student loans, they will be canceled. That was this weekend at the QA conference. That's awesome. Congratulations. I'm very happy for you. If you want to Venmo me some money, go ahead. I'm sure that it'll be fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, sometime today that's going to happen, and Trump's going to be back on the 24th. So that'll be something to look forward to because they said so. Oh. <laughs> now, I want to spend just a minute on this. I want to urge you to be skeptical. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I don't mean be cynical. Skeptical means, look, if you can prove this to me, if you've got facts, if you can push me towards something that is truly convincing, then I'll change my mind. But cynics don't believe anything. Cynics don't believe any evidence. They're completely close to it. And the fact that you're here tonight tells me a lot about you, because you came to have a conversation about the quality of information, you're open to hearing things that you may or may not like or may or may not even believe, and that's fine. I'm not here to convince you or sell you anything. What I would say to you, though, it says a lot about you that you are here to have a conversation. And I think that we're reaching a point, a dangerous point to me, I think we're reaching a point where it becomes difficult for people to change their minds. I don't understand why that's not a sign of intellectual curiosity. Think about it. If you have a person, and maybe some of you are going to go home this night at Thanksgiving, who's going to never have changed their mind in the last 40 years. How many, does that sound familiar to some of you? Yeah. So one question I would ask you is, is that person intellectually strong or is that person intellectually weak? 
Would it be a stronger position to say, you know what, this is what I believe, but I may have it wrong. Tell me why. Tell me, tell me, tell me some other way of thinking about this. See? Tell me some other way of thinking about this. If if you if you can show me where I'm wrong, I can change my mind. That says to me that you're intellectually secure. Somehow we got it in our minds that it's not okay to change your mind. And we journalists punish politicians who change their minds. I think that's too bad. I think it'd be nice if we said, you know what, he used to say this, but now he says this because he said he's seen evidence that leads him to believe that what he used to believe isn't true. Wouldn't that be refreshing? The question I would ask is, would you vote for him? <laughs> Which one looks like leadership to you? I grew up in segregated South. I grew up in Kentucky. And it wasn't really until I got to college that I started to meet people who weren't like me, white men. The joke's on me, however, because all my children are from other countries who are different races, and my house looks like the United Nations. So it's really, it's really been quite the, uh, the journey. But all of us have to be willing and open to learn new things. That's skeptical, not cynical. Don't be cynical. What does skeptical look like? And why does it cause a problem when we're not? This was actually the news release on the evening of May 20th, 2020. Sorry, May 25th, 2020. Anybody recognize that date? Yeah. When was the day? George Floyd. The original news release, and this is the actual original news release, said George said a man died after a medical incident during police interaction. It said the man died of medical distress. He died of medical distress because somebody's knee was on him, right? And this was the newscast the next morning. We do begin this morning with developing news. The man is dead as the police are calling a medical distress after being handcuffed. The officers were responding to a forgery in progress. It happened on the 3700 block of Chicago Avenue South. When they arrived, officers found a man they believed to be the suspect sitting inside a car. They apparently told him to get out. He resisted. Officers eventually got him handcuffed, which is when he appeared to have a medical issue. The suspect was taken to the hospital where he died a short time later. Now, as you know, later that morning, uh, social media video um, showed us a whole different story. And then we started questioning, well, what else do we need to know about this, right? But truthfully, it's one of those bright light moments when we should be saying from the very offset, okay, I hear you saying that this is how this person died. Let me see a medical exam. Let me see the, the uh, police cams. Let's, we should be asking for that kind of evidence all along. As an old journalist, I've been doing journalism now for right at 49 years. I can tell you that we've been way too reliant on police reports without ever questioning them. And I think now, finally, we are sort of at a moment where we're finding some independence from that. But we should have been skeptical all along. Instead, we were too dependent. Which brings me to a number of other examples. This one is, uh, forgive me, I, I'm, I'm going to make this up, but I think I've got it right. I think it was Nebraska. Could you look that up real quick? Could you mind? Barbara will look it up. I think it's Nebraska, but I, I, I'm having a senior moment where I'm doubting Nebraska. But let's pretend it was Nebraska because I can't remember. Um, police officer took a photograph. He went to McDonald's to the drive-in, uh, took a photograph of the coffee cup that he bought, and it said effing pig on it. He took a picture of it, put it on social media, big stir. Everybody said, oh my God, you know, I hate the police, the writing effing pig on the, on the coffee cup and so on. Uh, but it turns out he wrote it on there himself. <laughs> Nebraska? Kansas. That's sort of like Nebraska, right? <laughs> I, I, I knew enough to doubt it, though, didn't I? All right, good. Um, well, actually, that was a little piece of dis I almost had misinformation, didn't I? Uh, before I say that, let's check that. I mean, it's almost my instinct now. It's like, if I'm not exactly sure, let's be, uh, let's be careful here. Um, so in Indianapolis, also in McDonald's drive-in, police officer drove by, got his sandwich, took a picture of it, said, oh my God, look at this. I got a sandwich and there's already a bite out of it. What disrespect is that? Upon investigation, it turns out that he forgot he was the one who took the bite out of the sandwich. <laughs> I forgot. A 
a pretty famous case I've written a lot about was in New York City during the confrontations in Manhattan around the Black Lives Matter protests. And police officers uh, had a pretty violent night with protesters. And three of them ordered milkshakes at a Shake Shack there in Manhattan, pretty, pretty uh, well-known Shake Shack. And when they got to Shake Shack, um, they, one of them said, oh, this face, this tastes funny. And he said, oh my God, uh, maybe we've been poisoned. And he threw the milkshake in the trash and the other two threw their milkshake in the trash. And the union, the police union, which by the way, had been very critical of the treatment of their officers. The union said, our guys need to go to the hospital because they've been poisoned. And so they took them to the hospital. The union issued uh, various news releases that night saying, we've been, our, our guys have been poisoned as a matter of disrespect at the Shake Shack. There was no poison in the milkshakes. There was no poison in the police officers. Nothing happened. There was, there was no cleaning accident in the milkshake machine, as somebody said. None of that happened. It did not happen. In fact, it couldn't have happened that they were targeted because they ordered the milkshakes on an app. And so when they got there, the milkshakes were already ready for them. They couldn't have known who the milkshakes were for. It didn't happen. The police chief issued a statement saying there was no criminality by Shake Shack's employees, which is a long way from saying we completely made this up and there was nothing to it. So if one of you were to be arrested tonight and released, and they said, by the way, there was no criminality, that would uh, be different from, they were totally innocent, I don't know what we were thinking. Um, let's do one more. This one is near um, Salt Lake City. It's in Layton, Utah. This one was a subway where the police officer said that he had been poisoned and that there was cyanide in his soft drink. There was no cyanide in his soft drink. There was no cyanide in the police officer. It was completely wrong. And by the way, they're currently being sued for defamation because people set up protests outside of the subway, protesting them being so mean to our police officers. What do all these have in common? Well, first, they were wrong. But second, they all got publicity. And it's very difficult to get it right once you've gotten it so wrong. That will be a country music song or something, shouldn't it? Um, so that's the problem, trying to get the genie stuff back. And if you look at any one of these, if you search any one of these things online, you will see a reference to it. You will find every one of these. I did, you can too. And therein lies the problem, right? That a lie lives forever. And if what you're searching for is they are poisoning our officers, it'd be easy for you to prove that with false information. Be skeptical, but not cynical. So, this one hits a little home, close to home, right? Big debate tomorrow night. Um, Dr. Oz. And we learned uh, last week that this woman uh, who showed up at a Dr. Oz event. It was supposed to be a town hall meeting. Um, she showed up at a town hall meeting and she talked about her brother, brother, son, brother, we'll see, um, nephew, nephew and brother were fatally shot and killed. And so and it turns out that's actually true, that her nephew and son were actually killed in a gun incident. That's true. Here's what we don't know from this original news coverage from, uh, from television, from the Philly Inquirer, uh, from the Inquirer social media account. Here's what we don't know from this. She is a paid campaign worker for Dr. Oz. Why would that matter to you? Say again? Well, on the one hand, he seemed genuinely moved and surprised. And, and, you know, he goes over and he hugs her. He said, I don't know how you survived all of this. And, um, so there's, there's a basic truth under the event. She really did suffer this trauma. It's really tragic and really true. But the journalist who were covering this had no way of knowing that she was actually on his campaign. <clears throat> to me, that's at least misinformation because it's a lack of information. I don't know that anybody 
ended up fessing up and saying, no, no, we meant to mislead you. But she was very proud of the news. Armstrong talking about the crime and violence in the city as protesters held handmade signs about abortion and all the so the point here is, is that she was a person who showed up at this town hall meeting as if she was just a you know concerned citizen, and she was. But there was no disclosure of the event, at the event that she was a paid campaign worker. And therein sort of lies the problem. I have no idea whether Oz knew this or not. But, but the other thing that I would say to you is, is I started looking at this, this is KYW, ended up looking at this, where is, once we knew, about a week ago, once we knew that she was a paid campaign worker, I started looking to see whether or not all of the news coverage of that event made note of this once they all knew about it. And here's what's interesting. If you go five scrolls down, you will see in a previous version of this article, Sheila Armstrong was identified as a community activist. This was changed to Oz campaign staff after we were informed she was employed by the Oz campaign. Well, look, that's a pretty good disclosure. If you go five scrolls down on a story, why wouldn't that be at the top of the story? Well, it could, in somebody's eyes, make them look bad, but I think it makes them look pretty good that they got it right, they took note of it, and they put it on there. I just don't want, to, I don't know why you would bury it. And I think that undercuts people's trust in how transparent we are. If you get something wrong, if you have misinformation, get it right and play it as prominently as the bad information. That's all. I think people will say, well, they didn't know that, but now they know that, they're owning up to it, good, I can trust them. This is a thing in 2020. All of these look like regular newspapers, but they're not. It's campaign literature. And these kinds of things are showing up a lot around the country. Um, so the West Cook News, a Chicago City Wire and so on. Um, I'm going to buzz past that, but we're seeing this even in Pennsylvania, where increasingly there are these things that look like news sites, but they're actually campaign sites. In this case, um, in the Cook County case, they were Republican leaning. In this case, they're Democrat leaning. And it's interesting because this is an excerpt from one of them. All of the reporting that we put in the papers fact-checked and verified. A former Democratic Consultant Services Executive Editor of the Operation just so happens that Republicans are doing the bad things and Democrats are doing good things. That's why there's so much good news in the Democratic newspaper. <laughs> well, maybe, but probably not. Uh, so what I would say to you is, is, when you consume, consider the source. What do you know about the source? What do you know about their history? Have you done even the, the lightest amount of lifting to figure it out? Look, I support completely their right to publish this stuff. There's, there's no doubt they have the legal right, but I support completely the right for them to express their opinions. The problem is, is when we don't understand, we, we, it's our responsibility for we pass on somebody else to know what we're talking about. We don't advocate our responsibility to be good citizens. If you're going to say something, you better know what you're talking about because you're responsible for what you say. You're influencing people without ever knowing. By the way, I thought you'd be interested that the uh, those fake newspapers also have crossword puzzles. <laughs> it gives me a little bit of hope because I can actually solve these. So I, you know, I, I love that. Um, well, let's try one here. Uh, seven across. River obstructions. Three letters starts with D. I can get that right. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, number twelve down is. Mama blank, three letters. Okay, I can get that, right? So this is the kind of thing I can get behind. I, I, can, I can support this. All right. <laughs> Never mind. Um, blank DeVito, Danny. Uh, see content. So those of you of a certain age are paying a lot of attention to your 401ks these days, right? 
<laughs> thinking about going to be a Walmart greeter again, are you? <laughs> so, uh, what a couple of weeks ago, I was looking at the, uh, I, that was a big mistake, I looked at the 401k, and here's what I saw. I saw this graphic. And you know what? It was a Friday afternoon, and it wasn't the news I wanted, but uh, I could see a trend that was very disturbing. <laughs> this is a lesson in context. So, it's possible for something to be accurate, but not true. It's possible for something to be accurate, but not true. This graphic is accurate. But what do I need in order to really understand what's going on with the market? Well, maybe if I pull back and look at a five-day chart, or maybe if I look at a one-month chart, it would give me a different view. And maybe if I come back a little further year to date, or a full calendar year, or five years, or multiple years, and each one of these gives me a little different view. It doesn't make that one day loss any less accurate. It is accurate, but the truth of the matter is that the market is way up from where it was in 2008 when the recession hit. In fact, I thought this was interesting. It's about 3.6 times higher than it was at its base in in the Great Recession, start of the Great Recession. In fact, since 2008, it's averaged, the S&P um, index has averaged about a 10% return every year for 10 years. That's a pretty good return. And yet, all we can look at is the last week or two or month or two or half a month, year, whatever it is. Overall, we've done pretty well. Thank goodness, seniors, thank you. Um, <laughs> All right, so seek context. Look for the larger story. It's possible to be accurate, but not true. So, students, if this college education doesn't work out for you, now I'm going to teach you how to be a better liar so that you can make a living being a liar in this form. Uh, let's start by letting me show you how to create fake tweets, okay? So, this is... Um, a website called TweetGen, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a fake tweet, but we could use the same tool to also create a whole fake conversation if we want to. <laughs> so the, the beauty of this is, is that if, for example, I created a fake tweet, you know, we could create a tweet saying Dr. Oz withdrew tonight because he's embarrassed about the polls, and then we could have Fetterman respond by going, it's okay, Doc, it's going to be all right, you're fine, you've been a great sport, everything's going well, I really appreciate this race. And then we could do some responses, you know, from Trump and Biden, so we could do a whole list and people go, what is going on here, right? And it'd be, it'd be amazing. We could also, if, if you really want to become a martyr, what you want to do is get Twitter to block you. <laughs> Because that way you can say, I was so truthful that I became a threat to truth, right? So you could create a fake block saying Twitter blocked me because I liked vaccines. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you're a hero. Um, or you could do a suspension. Um, so let's do one, all right? So uh, let's do one from President Biden. And... Um, We're going to start by putting in his emoticon there, and let's just put in Joe Biden, and let's put in his handle, Joe Biden, and then let's do a little message for you tonight. So thanks for coming to Al's talk tonight. As a reward, I hereby forgive all Penn State students, uh, all Penn State students, get 100%, stay cool, Joe. So uh, now, so congratulations to all of you, and now let's just put in the dates so that we can make it believable, because we want this to be today. And we'll put in the time, 6 o'clock, because you knew we were meeting. And then we'll do a whole bunch of retweets so it looks legit. And then let's put in some quotes and some likes. And here we go. Rock and roll. So now oh, I'm going to go in and clean up a couple of things here. And let's do a possessive. Thank you very much. All right. So now we've got a really nice tweet. So what am I going to do with this? What I can do with this is I can take it as a screenshot and post it and circulate it. 
And then you say, well, but that's not on the president's website or it's not on the president's Twitter feed. Oh, yes. Lucky for you. I got it as soon as he posted it, then he pulled it down. What did I just do? I just started a rumor, right? Oh, he pulled it down because I'm on it. And I'm a big threat because I am the truth teller. And so now what I've done is I started, I started a rumor. And the rumor's going to go on. And I see you. So, well, you see all these retweets and stuff. And if I start a thread, that would be even better. I can guarantee you. Are you you're, doing, you're, you're doing one right now, aren't you? It's okay. I'm fine. Go ahead and do it. It's all good fun until somebody's eye gets put out. Um, all right. <laughs> she was laughing too much. I could tell she was up to something. All right, so let's see what we've learned so far today. Um, this is the Texas Department of Health Services, and they put out, this is their actual press release, so it's an actual screen capture of their press release. It said, Texas confirms first death of a person with monkeypox. All right, let's read. The Texas Department of Health Services has confirmed the first death of a person diagnosed with monkeypox in Texas. The patient was an adult resident of Harris County, was severely immunocompromised. Cases under investigation to determine what role monkeypox played in the death. Got it? All right, so look at, look at, let's look at some news coverage. <clears throat> Axios, Texas reports first death of person with monkeypox in the U.S. Is that accurate? Is it accurate? It's accurate. All of those facts are in their news release. Yes? Is it true? What does it imply? That they died of monkeypox. And what did the news release say? It said it was immunocompromised it's under investigation. Good. All right. Here's Stat News, a very prominent medical news website. Texas reports death tied to monkeypox, a first in the US. Is this accurate? No. Is it true? No. What's wrong with it? We don't know if it's tied. All we know is the person tested positive for monkeypox and they died. It's no more true than if you said they 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 tested positive for monkeypox, and they were in pink pajamas. Did the pink pajamas have anything to do with the death? Maybe, we don't know. Are other people in pink pajamas dying? We don't know. Texas officials report first monkeypox death. Accurate or true? Accurate or true? Yes, no? No, it's not even, it's not even close. It's just not accurate and it's not true. I think it's really funny because the television station moniker is expect more. <laughs> By the way, I do. Um, so in this case, they reported something that's just not true. The person did not necessarily die of monkeypox. They died with monkeypox. Be critical in your reading. Ask yourself, is that true? Is that right? Is that what the news really said? Because we know it's not. That's not what the news really said. It said we're still investigating. I can tell you that a lot of news organizations really walked the line on this one. But some of them did a really terrific job. People Magazine did a, a pretty good job. Channel 2 in Houston. Those of you who are uh, online people will hate the SEO from this, but uh, you know it's not, it's not going to make Google very happy. But you know the fact is it's true and accurate. All right, this is the best of all. Although headline writers would hate it, this is KJU and Houston. Headline writers would hate it. It's a lot of words, but it's accurate and it's true. All right, who's the guy on the left? <laughs> Don't be shy. Who's the guy on the left? Sean, Sean Handy. And he's on what? What channel? Fox wow. News. Who's the person in the middle? <clears throat> Trump's daughter in law, married to Eric Trump. Who's the guy over on the right? The yes, Sanchez, governor of the great state of my home state. Thank you. 
So um, this actually made big news. I mean, it got tons of traffic because uh, it was a day or two after the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago. Raided Mar-a-Lago, uh, served a warrant in Mar-a-Lago. See, even just the words you use. Uh, they served a search warrant in Mar-a-Lago and retrieved some documents that they said that they should have already had. So um, DeSantis is on Fox a lot and is sort of the darling of Fox. The Sanders used to really get along with Trump. He was a very much a Trumper, but now he and Trump are kind of on the frictional outs and sometimes are seen as possible adversaries in the next election cycle. So it's unusual to hear the Sanders directly criticizing Trump. I can't even remember him directly criticizing Trump. Um, but watch this. So this, this raid happened and it was a raid. It, it's not a raid. I mean, with all due respect. It, of course, was a raid. It was not a raid. They were serving valid process in accordance with the laws and constitution of the United States and the state of Florida. They did it with integrity. They did it with honor. And to say it's a raid uh, is, is disinformation. And you guys need to drop it. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. What's going on here? Say again? It's his state. Whose face? His state. What do you mean? Yeah, so what do you say? That he's picking up with a raid? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to make it sound like something that wasn't. What do you mean? So they keep saying raid because of the sound of that there was lawyers involved with within a respectful manner and raid implies that it was. Did you notice anything about the video? What'd you notice? He's twitching. Yeah. And he's twitching. What does that mean? The video is repeated. Now, here's a former chief photojournalist who has edited a lot of video in your time. You know that there's something wrong with the video. His hand. His hand. Okay, so let's watch his hand. He wants us to watch this hand. Did anybody notice that? All right, let's watch. This raid happened and it was a raid. It, it's not a raid. I mean, with all due respect. It, of course, was a raid. It was not a raid. Okay, now, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but our former photojournalist says that means what? Is it fake? They look like they're talking over each other. They look like they're arguing. Is this fake? Yes, it's 100% fake. It did not occur. These three videos got edited into a format that it looked like they were having an argument, but they didn't have this conversation. The Sanders didn't say those things about the Trump. What are we calling it? Are you calling it a raid? <laughs> um, the Trump uh, investigation. Um, that was a totally different news conference a year ago where he was talking about another raid on a state health worker. <laughs> this is this raid happened. This is. This is the news conference where that video came from. It's not a raid. I mean, with all due respect. It had nothing to do with Trump. Now, I put this on a big, gigantic screen, and some of you saw it, some of you didn't. But imagine now you're watching it on your phone, where it's even smaller, even more difficult to see that twitchy hand. And you'll probably never pick it up. You'll probably never pick it up. Because it's so juicy, you're going to share it. Even the Republicans don't agree on this now, including DeSantis, one of the leading candidates. Therein lies the problem, is that this information is becoming so very well produced, so effortlessly, it's more difficult for you to pick it up. Which is why I'm urging you to be really thoughtful and careful before you repeat it. Because every one of you have followers. Sometimes you don't even know it. People are looking to you, Penn State graduates. They're looking to you to say truthful, accurate things. After all, you went to Penn State. Right? <laughs> so what I would say to you is, is that you have a responsibility to do at least the minimum amount of investigation before you put your name on it. This is just not true. <laughs> Seeing is believing. <laughs> all right. Seeing is believing, but it shouldn't be. 
So I have this strange little hobby where I like to take pictures of graffiti. And I particularly like to take pictures of graffiti that I think is just particularly obnoxious, including uh, this graffiti carved into a redwood tree in the redwood forest, the Sequoia National Forest. And so um, let's do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use, you've heard of Photoshop, and some of you are vaguely aware of Photoshop you do. But Photoshop has a program on there called Content Aware Fill. It's been around a long time, but recently it's gotten really good. Content Aware Fill will allow you to, with one click, let's just get rid of a few of these scars that are on this tree. So I'm going to get rid of that scar. Now let's get rid of the big one and just replace it with some wood grain. All right, let's replace, so I heart me. I'm going to get rid of that. And now we'll just save it. That becomes that. Easy peasy. But wait, there's more. Content Aware Phil, during the pandemic, started to notice that people didn't just want to get rid of stuff, they wanted to get rid of people. So if you have annoying people in your photographs and you'd like to get rid of them, let's say, for example, we want to get rid of her. Content Aware Phil now, with one click, will allow you to click on that individual and get rid of them. But the problem here is, is that it's dropped what we call a remnant, an unbelievable bush. No problem. If we want to put that bush where that one is, because that one's not too believable, no problem. We'll just one click, get rid of the bad bush, and put in the good bush. And now we have a much nicer, much more believable photograph. Imagine the 10 million ways this could be used on a news photograph to get rid of somebody <laughs> in a picture who you don't want. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Content Aware Phil noticed that we didn't just want to get rid of things, we also wanted to add things. So the new Content Aware Phil is also additive. I've got a broken butterfly wing. All I got to do now is click on it and say, oh, I'll bet you want that one to look like the other one. No problem. So now I have a perfect butterfly. But wait. <laughs> Content Aware Phil is made by Adobe. Adobe also makes an edit program called Premiere. Premiere Pro will allow you to do something that heretofore we haven't been able to do easily. They have content we're filled for video. And so now we've got a horse, a rider, a shadow, and tracks in the sand. Let's say that I want to get rid of the horse, the rider, and the shadow, but keep the waves and the tracks. No problem. All I got to do is click on the horse, the rider, and the shadow, remove them, save and play, I have the mysterious hoof marks and the waves, but no horse, no rider, no shadow. No problem. You know, from a disinformation point of view, this is a real big problem. Because it used to be we were all, we, we got photos Photoshop. We knew that. But now, video also is equally unbelievable. And really easy to do. I mean, that's real time how long it would take to get rid of that. This is Ukraine. So one of the things I was really interested in, I'm going to give you one more, one more quick little example in our time. One of the things I do is whenever there's a major news event, like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is I'm looking for fake examples. And this was the first one, the morning that the invasion allegedly was going on, I started seeing this video, this particular video, over and over and over again. Now, I'm going to stipulate that the houses here are actually in the suburb of Kiev. And you'll see some license tags that are genuinely Ukrainian license tags in this image, okay? Anybody got any issues with this video? Any thoughts? Go ahead. One of the planes disappeared behind the pole. Tell me, tell me, well, let's watch it again. Oh, come on, horse. Get back. Over. Come on.
good. Good eye, though. That's a good thing to watch for, because if he had disappeared, we go, oh, wait, why, 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 Any other questions? Is this real? Yes? All right, so I'm sitting at my, this is a real story, I'm sitting at our dining table watching this video Saturday morning. My son, who's 24 years old, master's degree criminology, <clears throat> he says, hey, Pop, what are you doing? So I'm just, you know, looking at some videos around Ukraine. He says, you're not going to show that to anybody, right? Well, probably not now. Why? <laughs> he said, that's not real. I said, what is it? He said, it's a video game. <laughs> a video game? Yeah, he says, it's from Ghost of Key. Anybody know this? Any of you guys know this? Any of you gamers? No? So what they did is they took video from a video game and laid it over one layer, laid it over actual video of a Russian airplane going through the sky. So they just, they took gamer video and put it over top of it. It turns out this is pretty common, um, that we see this kind of misinformation, disinformation happening from gamer video being laid over. So with that in mind, let me do a quick quiz. This was video that I captured the night of the invasion, is this real or not? Real or not? I may say yes, raise your hand. I may say yes, I may say no, raise your hand. Why do you say no? Because I just lied to you a minute ago, now you think I'm lying to you, is that what this is? Be skeptical, don't be cynical. All right. Yeah, this is real, actually. Uh, I was able to get several versions of these same explosions from different angles, and it's real. Um, all right, let's do one more. I see this one quite a lot. Real or not? Looks fake, why does it look fake? Let's use our common sense just for a second. Sometimes we overthink this. If your city was under attack, would you A, turn on all your lights so that you could be a good target, or B, turn off your lights? Okay, it doesn't make common sense. This is obviously a video game. Um, <laughs> when you think about it, you go, oh, little, little, little. yeah, okay, fine. Um, all right. Let me inoculate you then against how to know whether a photo is real or not. Okay, so you can use this open source website called Jeffrey Stewart. And what Jeffrey's viewer allows you to do is to look at metadata. Metadata is the hidden data that is behind any digital file. So any file you make on any computer device, whether it's a computer, laptop, uh, your phone, whatever it is, you just took a picture of that, you got a photograph, but you also have metadata behind that photograph that will tell me exactly where you were when you took that picture, what kind of camera you were, and everything. I'll show you. So, Let's do that real quick. I'm just going to take a photograph out of my photo file. Let's choose to choose file. Let's take a picture out of my file. In this case, it'll be a picture of my office at the Pointer Institute in St. Petersburg. Okay? So there's my office. If I drag that office into Jeffrey's viewer, this is what's going to pop up. It's going to say that photograph was taken on February 22nd, 1156, and it'll give me the latitude and longitude. All I gotta do is take that latitude and longitude, drop it into Google, and it will map it for me. Easy as that. It'll just go, whoops, there it is. Lays it on top of the Pointer Institute building. Not only will it lay it on the building, it actually lays it on the right side of the building where my office is, within about 50 feet because it's looking at the metadata that's on that photograph. Every photograph that you take will have metadata on it unless you intentionally remove it. So we can track whether or not a photo is real. Metadata reveals the secrets of the videos, audio, photo, documents, Excel spreadsheets, anything you create. So for example, if I have a Word document and I want to know when that Word document was created, all I have to do is do this. Go down to Properties, and open up Summary, and it'll say that was created on July 25th. It was modified on July 26th. 
they'll tell you that it's been modified 16 times. Because this was my column that you had to edit. So uh, 16 times. All right, last, last example then. This one I think is a really interesting one because it was the very foundation for the Russian involvement in Ukraine. And so this isn't a small thing, this is a really big thing. The Russian news agency TASS, which is an official news agency of the Russian government, posted videos saying, posted two videos, this was the first of them, saying that uh, the Russian forces prevented several blasts attempted by Ukrainian saboteurs. And they said, we are posting this video to prove that the Ukrainian saboteurs were coming into Russian territory and attacking brave Russian soldiers. We have to fight back. That was, that was the reason that they gave for the initial invasion. So this was the official news agency task news release. And they released video. So let's watch it. Now, just so you can acclimate yourself, um, uh, apparently, the firefight was so um, was so terrifying that the photographer was lying down, and uh, this is actually the sky here. Okay, so he's lying down, and and the camera is faced that way. Okay, and so this is the evidence. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take that video, and we're going to look at the metadata. For reasons that nobody seems to be able to explain, they posted this video on a Eastern European social media site called Telegram. And Telegram, unlike Facebook or Instagram or, or, or TikTok, actually posts the metadata. So you can see the metadata on the video. Oh, that'll be interesting. So let's pull up the video and look at the metadata. First, I want to lay this down on a quick waveform monitor because this is going to be important to us. Now, we're going to look at the metadata. And we can see that all of this looks right, but somewhere in the metadata, they say that it has an audio file that has been added to the video file. This makes no sense at all. If you're posting a video, why would you have a separate audio file? And so we're saying, well, that's kind of bizarre. I wonder what that's all about. So let's just copy that information that it just gave us. Let's just copy that and see what it gives us. And what it gives us is we see, I don't know what this means, but that's what we copied. That's what the audio source was. And it said that it was captured a firing range, April 2010, by Finnish defense forces. Finnish defense forces. Wait a minute, what? The audio came from 2010 from Finnish defense forces. What was that? And so, let's just go to YouTube and look at the video, and we could. So, the, so the, the audio actually comes from. A lot of fire exercise. There's no doubt that the audio that they posted was, in fact, audio that came from a 2010 Finnish Defense Forces file. What can we truthfully say? We can truthfully say, I don't know if it's fake, I don't know, I, all I can truthfully say is this that the Russian news agency TASS, which is the official government news website, posted video that it said showed why they invaded Ukraine. And that video had audio that tracks back to a Finnish Defense Forces live exercise 12 years ago. I don't know whether the video is fake, but what I know is the audio isn't what it appeared to be. All of this took a grand total of about three minutes of investigation. All you gotta do is open up Look at the metadata, and there it is. So what do we learn from all of this? Well, first I would say, remember this. Your mother was right. Don't repeat it if you don't know it's true. Do the minimum work. It's your reputation. Do the minimum work to see whether or not it is possible that it's true. 
somebody is watching you. Somebody is taking their cues from you because they think you're smart. They think you know what you're talking about. And so you have a basic responsibility, it seems to me, a civic responsibility to know what you're talking about. Be skeptical, not cynical. Be skeptical, not cynical. And use your skills for good. You know, there's a lot of confusion out there, but when you go home for Thanksgiving, you're gonna hear crazy Uncle Frank tell you all kinds of crazy stuff. But by the way, they're gonna think you're crazy too. Don't try to convince them that they're wrong or that you're right. But instead say, well, that's really interesting. How do you know that? Why do you think that? Would you be open to some other way of thinking about that? If the answer is no, don't bother. But if the answer is yes, it's an engaging and unique conversation. Listen, I'm so appreciative that you came tonight. You could be doing something else, but instead you invested a little time trying to find some truth. Thank you for being here.